Hey guys, welcome to Solo React Talk. Today I'm going to be reacting to episode 21 After Talk made by A Family Too Much Time. Um, yes, this was supposed to be done last night, but we had a scheduled load shedding event. Um, it was from 9 to 11 o'clock in the evening, and I fell asleep. I didn't wake up <laughs> at 11. So here I am now, uh, the next day. And yeah, we're going to continue on with Star Wars vs. Warhammer 40k episode 21, Struggle, made by a fan of too much time. This is the after talk. If you want to check out uh, the previous or the episode as well as previous episodes, reactions, remember the playlist card is going to be at the top. Just click on it and you'll be able to access them. If you want to check out the original video as well as a fan of too much time's YouTube channel, the links are in the description below. Okay, let's start. Three, two, one go hey there guys this is a fan with too much time and here i am for the q a and after talk that i um i had i already made it for the past video and it's funny because in that after talk i go through all the things i'm going to talk about here and you know a bit more because i'm going to give it its own dedicated video but what's funny is that <laughs> this this production this 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 video here was like the test, like for me. Like if I was gonna drop this series, it would have been on this video because, oh my God. And then on top of that, the after talk gets junked. You guys don't understand, let me let me explain it to you. So, because you, you can't read my mind. Um, so I got some writer's block for this episode because it is literally the mid to late midpoint of the whole battle. Now everything is going to start conglomerating into like a single area, a single place. So you're gonna start seeing that happen, um, and 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 stories about to about to tie up. Um, it's it's you might think that because Sando got added in, that um that we're about to add in more narrative, but really Sando is just covering a front that Ayla can't be in right now. Um, so that's that's well, that's not the whole reason Sando exists, but that is the reason you're being introduced to him here now and where, why he's there at the front of the column. Yeah, well, I don't know if he's going to last long because him and his uh, platoon of clone troopers, they're going to be facing up against a a Astartes sp uh, space marine. And yeah, I, I well, from history, it seems that clone troopers don't last long against space marines. So he might not make it. Um, good luck to him. Hmm. Um... So in any case, I got writer's block, had to get over that, and then I started losing my voice, which is a very weird experience. I mean, I've been through a lot of experiences where I've been like kind of weirdly injured, so um, it's always a surreal experience for a person as, <laughs> I guess you might say, as like self-oriented or even self-centered as me when my body won't respond to me correctly. <laughs> so, you know, you go to say something and your voice just doesn't come out. It's a weird ass experience, for me at least. But, um, so that happened, that was no fun. Had to wait about two weeks, a little less, for that to completely scab over and heal. Um, and that's like, okay, you know, what is that? That's just bad luck. There's no reason to, to test, like, to, to, to dislike the episode or any problem with that in particular. It's just a thing that happens, right? And you know, uh, I finished too much time you know, he voice acts all of these different characters, you know, from the Inquisitor to Obi-Wan Kenobi, Anakin Skywalker, uh, any female character like Nerva, he voice acts her as well. Then he also voice acts the Astra Militarum soldiers and then also Major Lazarus and then the tech priests and then this person and that person. So he's doing a lot. He's doing a lot of voice acting here. And, you know, it's no surprise that, you know, his voice would be a bit damaged after something like that. Um, but yeah, I must commend him for his diligence and his hard work uh, so far. Um, yeah, it's not easy. It's not easy. Well, then I lost the script. Like, I'm not even quite sure how I lost it because I keep these things like, well... I don't keep them in a way that they should, they've ever been lost before, and I still do not understand how that script was lost. It is a huge mystery to me, but in effect, the week of 
recording, I had to rewrite the script, which is why you'll see that it's a little... Man, let me tell you, if I didn't swear to myself that I wasn't going to miss this deadline, I would have worked on this video more and, like, re-edited it because... And I don't, I don't mean just the, the video itself, the, the script, because I had to rewrite the whole script from memory of what I had written before. And I... Ah, oh, man, and you might not get it accurately done like before. You know, you know, you might miss some sentences here or some sentences sentences there. And, you know, it... it, it, it probably doesn't feel like the first one and you know you might be a bit disappointed in that I do it quickly in a rush and oh my god I, it is hard for me to describe to you guys how much I fucking hate having to rewrite the stuff I've already written especially if it's if it was good and it's just having to be rewritten for like for reasons like this so I had to do that, and that was a huge pain in my butt, but I did it because I had this thing dead set where I wasn't going to allow anything else to get in the way of this video and its release, no matter what. So I did it. And then, I record the raws, which is like three hours of raw takes, because, like, you know, every for every ten minutes of video you hear, there's like twenty or thirty minutes of me doing takes that are basically no good because the way that I record is that I say a sentence basically and I just repeat it over and over again until it makes until I've said it correctly because I'm pretty badly dyslexic I've had a lifetime of experience trying to get around it so I'm pretty good at managing it but when it comes to reading scripts and reading them smoothly it's difficult for me to read smoothly and speak out loud smoothly because of these reasons um, just results in me having to take several takes. So, three hours of raw takes. Gone. Gone. I don't know what happened to them. I don't know what happened to them. My system is set up so that these things can't happen. I don't know where it is. Maybe it's not gone. Maybe it's lost. Though I've t turned my computer inside out looking for this freaking thing. Maybe you didn't save them. Maybe you thought you saved them, but you didn't. And then you closed the program and then you were doing something else. And then when you came back to look for this, uh, this audio, you couldn't find it. Maybe because you didn't save it. Maybe. I don't know. It can happen. It can happen. Because trust me, the last thing I want to do, especially after having just recovered my voice, is sit down and try to kill it again. <laughs> so... Oh man, so after like a day and a half of searching and burning that time that should have just been spent recording the video, um, well, I mean not recording but editing the video recordings together, um, I was forced to conclude that I had to choose between just putting the video down and maybe writing a new script and doing a whole different thing because God, you can't imagine how much I don't want to retread like ground, even to the point of writing an entirely new script and taking the story in a different direction, which is bad. This is my human emotion pushing against my professionalism as a writer um, for whatever professionalism is worth in fan fiction. But the point is just that there was that hard temptation that was really calling to me. Um, and I'll tell you, every single voice that you can think of that would make a person stop is like, oh, you've written enough of this. Oh, you're not getting paid for all this. Just everything came up. It's like, don't do this to yourself. Don't. But, you know, a man has his principles, as stupid as that might sound, coming from a person just writing a thing on the internet. It's like I had decided that this crap was going to get published, that this was coming out. This is coming out. I'm not going to not do this. So, so I re-recorded the audio, and it came out to less than three hours this time. You know why? Because I have freaking practice now with a single script. I hate that I have practice with a, with a single script. Like, the reason it takes me three hours to record these and make it sound anything near good is just because I haven't really read the script out loud before I begin doing it. Um, well, that and other reasons, but there you go. But now I have experience with this script, right? So you think, okay, that is pretty bad. That is pretty hardcore stuff. And it, it really is, because this is why I didn't give you guys this update. I updated you guys when I had my uh, writer's block, and I updated you guys when I had my voice loss. But at the, at the point where the script gets lost and the raw gets deleted or, or lost, it gets to the point where I'm like, if I update people on stuff like this and don't just job it and tank it, they're going to think I'm making mis- like, not mistakes, but excuses. Like, because what are the chances? Like, honestly, what are the chances that all this crap actually happens in a single production? It's really weird and, and unusual. Uh, you know, my issue is uh, my country 
in terms of it having these load shedding events uh power outages or blackouts as some would call it uh you know half of the country doesn't have power while the rest of the country does have power and you know it alternates like that um yes thankfully we do have an application on our cell phones that tells us when exactly the timetable for load shedding is going to occur right um and of course there's like stages like stage one two four five six seven well we haven't reached seven i think i can't remember <laughs> but you know um which then determines the frequency of power outages you know uh and usually we have like three power cuts a day you know one in the morning one in the afternoon and one in the evening and then uh they last for like two hours or so so i just don't have enough time to be reacting to videos editing the videos uh exporting the videos and then of course posting them on youtube and then writing down the particulars and all that other stuff uh there's just not enough time uh and for instance if it's like a power outage from three to five uh i try to stay awake for those two hours i listen to things i read books but then eventually there are times where i just fall asleep <laughs> and then i wake up i wake up at seven o'clock in the evening you know and then the next power outage is at nine o'clock to eleven o'clock can you imagine that so now i only have like two hours left to do uh, whatever i need to do and then the power goes out again and then it comes back at 11 and then i don't wake up sometimes at 11 o'clock i'm fast asleep <laughs> i wake up at 3 a.m in the morning 3 a.m there's another power outage uh happening until five o'clock in the morning so i can't catch a break when it comes to my country and its power outage situation and we're going to be dealing with this for the next two years if i'm not mistaken um hopefully that's not true hopefully they can fix this as soon as possible but you know it's really it's a struggle <laughs> i can't even i can't even uh, uh you know keep up with my schedule i'm always catching up i'm always catching up and yeah it's an issue but i like what i'm doing uh, i enjoy what i'm doing it's just that yeah my country is really dragging me down yeah okay so i decided i wasn't gonna fill you guys in on that and i was just gonna job this as much as i could um and finish it and then maybe talk about it like i'm doing here in the after talk for the video and then it got deleted again I, and it, not the same way this time i actually know how it was deleted and it was a real bonehead move that i was that i made because i was basically like just sleepy and it's one of those things where it's just because it was in a program it doesn't go to your fr it doesn't go to your freaking recycle bin so you can't recover it and i'm like that oh my god like i feel like i feel what it's like to have been murdered literally like like not literally literarily murdered by my own hand like committed literary suicide um because i hated this script at this point and now i have to voice it again oh my god no please i've already voiced this thing oh my god so then i had to re 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 record this stupid thing and my goodness it's funny though because i'll be totally honest with you guys it was easier to job it and to just do it the the last time than it was the middle time because by the time it came around to the last time, i'm like i don't care if i'm a zombie person by the time monday comes around okay i've already made the hard choice before this that it's gonna happen and i've already put too much effort into this to not let it like to let it not happen so like sunken cost fallacy suddenly like worked in my favor and I was able to, to to job this thing. But when you hear those recordings and you hear all that crap, I don't know what the hell was wrong with this. It's like the jinxed episode. Would you think it would be like episode 13? No, I, I, this is the jinxed episode. Episode 21. No idea why. What are these horses? Um, I see one that looks like a normal horse, I think. You know, the, the black one here. And then that one in the middle there's something going on going on with its jaw it kind of looks like a resident evil kind of creature and then the third horse looks like an alien horse or uh 
you know, a mixture of a fish with a horse. Yeah. Hmm. And holy cow, man. I read that script so much. Like, I tried so hard for this last reading to, like, make it sound good, which there was something wrong with my microphone. You'll notice it mess up a few times. But as I was reading all those lines that you heard in the last episode, I was hating it every freaking second of it like it was all i could do to not let that seep through into the perform into the performance which having you know like looked at the uh the 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 reception to the video it doesn't seem that it did which is good because that's very good that's very good you you have that professionalism about you you know you you divide your work from your frustrations and your anger and that's very important you know, we, uh, you, you don't want your viewers or your listeners to be distracted and start thinking about other things when you're presenting your work. You want them to hear your work and your work alone, nothing else. And you've done that. Yes. Good job. Keep it up. My God. So many takes I had to discard for that last take because it just sounded like I was pissed. <laughs> in scenes where it wouldn't have made sense for the uh, for the narrator, the author, to sound that way. So, um, God, it, you know, and this is just me venting. Like, sometimes a man's got a vent. This is a weird thing that happened to me. I still can't get over it. This can't happen again. I, I'm, I don't even know how it happened for the most part, but I'm taking new precautions and stuff because this is like, this has never happened. It's never come close to happening like this, but it can't happen again. Like, there can't even be a 1% chance of this happening because it's like... Holy crap, man. This dragged me through the mud this freaking week. Dragged me through the freaking mud with this stupid episode. And it wasn't, you know, it was a very unique problem. The, the, the fact that just... In any case, yeah, just Murphy's Law all over the place with this episode. My, my brain feels broken over this crap. Whatever. Hopefully the next episode will have nothing close to that kind of crazy bullshit. Um, but that aside and out of the way, let me go ahead and run through a few of you guys' as, um, is, uh, your Q&As. Now that you've heard my whole spiel about the insanity of this episode, I'll go ahead and, uh, and do some Q&As for this and the last two videos. Because I think I was supposed to do that too. So let's, let's see if I can do five here, five there, five there, how that works out. So... Let's take a quick look. Uh, I'll go ahead and reload this just in case more people have posted. Alright. Q&A. Commission or fan art, even if it's just in the after talks? Commissions or fan art, even if it's just in the after talks? I don't know how you mean that. Um, that's donk face. Donk face. Are you asking me if I should ask for commissions or pay for more of them, rather? Or if I should ask for a fan, fan art? Um... It's funny. I think that in this after talk, you're actually going to see some of the um, some of the bestiary art that I have made for my own work, which I will debut at some point after this series is probably done and concluded. Wait, is it these horses here? Your your bestiary work? Okay. Um, because I don't want to conflate them, at least. Uh, but. Okay. So wait, let me just. <laughs> what is this? Let's zoom in. Um, Plains Manticore, all right. Oh, I don't like the font. I don't like this font. Uh, the most well-known kind. These Manticore have golden pelts and and what? The font. I'm sorry, but the font is killing me. <laughs> Running in packs of. Three or four, these manticore are the size of lions and can often, okay, often be heard at night roaring with their early human voices. Wow. Okay. Um, I don't have a lot of money. Um, I had a budget at the start of this for, for Warhammer fan... Uh, arting, the artings, <laughs> artings, uh, fan drawings and, and commissions that I would pay for with the understanding that this series would have been less than half the length that it is now. Um, so I used it all up, all the budget. I actually do have one or two more images coming for particular moments that are planned 
Um, but we haven't quite gotten there yet, and I thought that we would have gotten there by now, but there you go. I'm just going about it that way. Um, but uh, I can't really pay for more commissions as I am now. I have what I have. Uh, fan art, if you guys want to send me fan art, feel free to send me fan art. That's 100% okay. I'm 100% all right with that. Um, and send me explicit permission to use the fan art because this is, this is what I can't do. I can't ask for free art. I've had friends who are artists who have expressed to me what that's like and um, and how often they get it, you know? And, uh, and I can't in good conscience ask a person to put in effort that is comparable to what I do, just in the scape of a visual art, and do it for free, you know? I'm doing this for free because in my mind, this work needs to exist. The fact that that IPs exist and capitalism is the way that we work, most of our industries can't preclude something like this from existing in my mind. There isn't a justice if there is. It's a stupid thing I've got hung up in my head, but the point is that I'm doing this very much of my own free will. I don't feel right coercing or even asking people to give me free art. If you have art, if you've drawn art, if you felt inspired uh, independently, then feel free to send it to me and I'll definitely show it off. But this reminds me of uh, Kubik and his work. Uh, you know, the artist impressions of what's going on in a particular storyline or situation in whichever episode. Yeah, very convincing, you know, very bloody, gory, uh, showing you the reality of things. And then also sometimes it looks kind of cute and funny, um, especially like with the previous episode, episode 20, uh, you know, how he showed all the Ashram and the Tarim and then that one tech priest <laughs> who's joining in the battle uh, that that one was so funny i don't know why i found that funny i, I just did you know because you see all these astram and the tarim and then you just see that one tech priest there you know tr uh, aiming his gun at the enemy i just found that quite funny and interesting um because i've always had this thing in my mind you know astram and the tarim they are the fighters the tech priests they are the engineers, they are the people in the background, they are the people who are also attending for medical services, and then that's it. You know, I don't imagine them on the front line and fighting against the enemy. Maybe the Skatari, but that's the Skatari, not Tech Priest. Tech Priest is different. So, yeah, when I saw that image, I, it really made me chuckle a bit. Um, and yeah, Kubik has been supplying some very good quality work out here. Hmm. I'm sure there's other people who are also supplying, you know, the artwork, but um, I think it's due to my fault. I haven't read down at the bottom that, you know, this artistry is accredited to this particular person. I'm not sure. Um, but yeah, I'm sure there's other people and yeah, they're also doing a good job. But um, as for more commissions, I'm just out of money. Uh, in any case, let's move on to the next one. So, Spook. Ah, always good to see you, Spook. Oh, are you going to be asking about C82 and Ahsoka? Please don't. So let's see here, q and I'm just putting this as a reminder for you to give me the numbers, uh, the names of the regiments, and okay, let me go ahead and say this here. I can't give you those numbers right now, in large part because while I have a plan, and I have these numbers, and I have a plan for how to use them, what I've seen as I've been writing this out is that sometimes things shift around. And if I give you those numbers, I'm dedicating to those numbers. And I may want more or less. It, it, it depends on what the narrative calls for. So I am working with a baseline of what is needed, but I'm also not an actual strategist, nor am I a logistician or a person who's really aware of, of war outside of fiction, really. You see what I'm saying? So while I consider myself kind of a learned person, I'm not learned enough to exert and imply those numbers with a great enough amount of certainty to say, okay, this is where I want it to be and it can't change from here. So for that reason, I will tell you that I have ballparks. I actually have precise numbers for everything here, but I can't dedicate to those precise numbers because I myself am a goober and may not know or not know what we need or don't need. So, so that's why I can't really fill in those numbers. Um, in any case... Uh, and you're asking for the regiments and chapters and, um, let's leave that, let's just leave that to see what gets revealed. Because again, 
if I give you what regiments are here, I'm also dedicating to what regiments aren't. And if I give you what regiments are here and don't have time to put them in or the narrative shifts, then it feels like I've gypped you because I promised you or told you that these regiments were involved, but they never came into the, um, into the four. And again, those are all commitments that I feel like an 80 or 70% chance that I can make and fulfill on them. But because there's a 30 or 40% chance that I can't, um, or 30 or 20 percent chance that's just too high for me to make those commitments and come out with egg on my face um, over that kind of thing so for numbers and those kinds of deployments it'll just have to be sort of a a thing you have to wait for the box to be open to find out so let's go ahead to the next piece also i have one other question space battles in warhammer 40k are usually shown to take place over millions of kilometers while battles in star wars seem to take place over a few hundred or dozen kilometers how will you compare this discrepancy? Will you scale up Star Wars ship pivot? Or... No, actually you'll notice that I didn't do those things. We already had a ship battle at the start of the series and that was a huge problem that uh, the um, the Republic had to confront was the, the limited range of their weapons. Um, and it's not even the case that the weapons can't go out that far. They just can't go out that far fast enough to catch the enemy in transit. Um, so you will notice that far before the uh, Republic fleet was able to open fire and begin their salvos, the Imperial fleet had already begun firing. And yes, while some of those uh, lance ca cannons that you saw being fired from the very beginning were like, um, I think they're called Godsbane or other kinds of extremely long-ranged las cannons, in particular, it's those open fire first just because that's the protocol, but a lot of weapons open fire at very high range. It is just the fact that in 40k, we are shown this to be the case, and um, and hey, you know what? It's possible that there will now be visual mediums that come into 40K because of what GW is doing that will show us, um, because of cinematics and stuff, uh, that Warhammer 40K battles aren't just waged at super high lengths. I mean, I'll say this. Warhammer battles has been shown to us both in the literature and in cutscenes of existing games and other things that they can take place at massive distance. And they can take place at the exact same distances or closer that Star Wars ships are used to functioning at. Um, uh, Warhammer 40k ships have ramming capacities, and they don't have those capacities because they don't get close to each other. So, it's not quite as bad as all that. But, um, but definitely that will be noticed, um, and I'm not going to scale up or scale anything down. The Republic is going to have to examine this problem and think up of a... Um, a solution, a way of getting around it. And hey, those of you who know Thrawn and who know other uh, Republic tacticians who have managed to do some pretty cool shit with their ships will probably start to figure out how the Republic begins to solve this 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 issue. Yeah, I think the Republic will adapt. Also the Separatists, they will adapt uh, to this new type of long-distance warfare that the Warhammer 40k or the Imperium of Man uh, seems to engage at, uh, especially from the get-go. I think, you know, they will adapt. They will either upgrade their vessels or they will design new tactics that allow their vessels to enter into combat, you know, in the mid-range or in close-quarter combat. Um, they will find a way eventually. Um, so, yeah, he doesn't need to upscale the, the Star Wars uh, galaxy fleets, you know, to match up with the Imperium of Man. They will have to adapt. Hmm. Um, so, let's go ahead and move down from there. Um, you know, th these images and the information, I think I'm going to read them uh, on a later time. Not right now, as I'm trying to concentrate and listen to a fan with too much time. Um, but yeah, the font is... I'm not a fan. <laughs> I'm not a fan of the font. So yeah, it's, it's a bit difficult for me, but uh, I'll read them later on. <clears throat> All right, so the next one is Captain General Kitten. Let's see. Q&A. Hi there. I have a question for what will happen if orcs against if orcs against the separatists as we know orcs love Danka, but they suck at aiming and re and really stupid so the battle droids but they so as the battle droids but they share the same thing with the 
thing was that they got numbers. Uh, P.S. Will you have any plan of making a story for Orcs vs. Separatists? Currently, no. Not, no. I, if I was going to do Orcs vs. Separatists, I'd basically have to make its own setting for it. Just because there's no way of making Orcs vs. Separatists. It'd be more like Orcs vs. Separatists vs. Imperium. Because the Imperium is here, and the Imperium is extremely, extremely hostile to the Separatists. Much more than the Orcs ever would be. The Orcs obviously wouldn't be fighting the Separatists. They would just be doing what they're normally doing. Fighting everyone in general. Um, maybe making alliances of convenience when they think this, when they think that uh, that defeat is basically looming or inevitable. But typically speaking, the orcs don't differentiate their enemies from each other outside of what they look like, which is typically why when orcs describe um, other factions, they typically describe them not always, but typically via a, a physical feature because that's all that really they're not you know most orcs even orc commanders barely parse the difference between diplomacy just talking and commanding and the fact that there's different aliens that they're fighting um they do parse those differences but just barely the standard orc boy doesn't and the standard orc boss that isn't big enough to run a whole wall doesn't um so that's kind of why that's sort of a it wouldn't it, it, it would be just <laughs> chaos but not the chaos that is brewing currently so let's take a look here and, you know, I did, you know, state that I like the fact that Star Wars vs. Warhammer 40k is centered around the Imperium of Man and the two factions of the Galactic Republic, of the Star Wars Galaxy, you know, the Galactic Republic and the Separatists. Uh, you already have numerous numbers of uh, factions within the Imperium of Man. You know, I'm already satisfied. Um, adding in the orcs or the necron tier or the dark elder or the aldari or, or the um uh the tau or any of these other factions I, i'm not really a fan of that you know i'm a fan of what's going on right here right now with the imperium of man and uh, the star wars galaxy i'm much more you know uh much more in tune to like that than to add in these other factions because they're going to steal the spotlight <laughs> from these characters that are already being cultivated in Star Wars versus Warhammer 40k, you know. If you put in uh, the Orcs and the Necron tier and all these other factions, they're also going to have to have their own time in the sun. And, you know, I don't want to have my interests being split into different various uh, factions. I like the fact that we have these two opposing forces or three opposing forces because you know you never know when the separatists might decide okay we're going to attack the galactic republic again but you know these three separate forces fighting in this one galaxy i'm okay with that you know yes you can have demons here and there and you know you can have that uh, uh inquisitor with his associates if you if you can call them that you know uh, but Mainly, the spotlight doesn't deviate away from the Imperium of Man as the opposing force in the galaxy, and that's what I like. Um, but if a fan of too much time does add in other factions, you know, that's to his, his own discretion, and um, I hope it will be just as enjoyable as it is right now with the Imperium of Man. Yeah. Hmm. Histovan. So, Histovan, Q&A. One, will the Chaos Gods take an interest in the Crusade fleet that has been flung so far away? Uh, and will Celestials like Witzek and the Ones are powerful? You're going to have to wait to see how the Bedlam Spirits, the Wills, uh, the Ones are, you know, I mean, the Ones are, are, are dead right now. But you're going to have to wait to see what the powerful Celestial forces of Star Wars, who basically hang in the background of Legends most of the time, how they react to this, if they react at all. Because remember, in the face of this crap, uh, a, a not necessarily unwise reaction would be to just shut up and stay quiet and stay out of the way. I mean, the Imperium is definitely the first god-killer faction that is a government that has entered the Star Wars galaxy. The Republic has never really been in that capacity. Not really. Neither has a Sith Empire, really, mostly because it's too busy eating itself. Um, so let's take a look here. Uh, question two. 
Will there be a schism in the Mechanicus forces over the study of Star Wars technology and droids or C-82's revelation? Okay, so... The Mechanicus is basically a technological allegory. I love this. I mean, I'm not even necessarily, like, really Catholic or anything. I just... I just love that they did this. The Mechanicus is the Catholic Church, and the Imperium is the Holy Roman Empire. And this is really obvious if you begin to take apart the analogies and, and like, the, the, the way that everything is set up. But... Um, how do I say this? It's like division <laughs> and schisms are the whole are the Mechanicus's whole thing. When you look into the Mechanicus's history, only recently is it like relatively recently is it that that they're all about Necrons and it's sort of Necron versus Mechanicus and the Mechanicus taking this big interest and and all this crap. And I guess that's sort of representative of... It could be representative of how the Catholic Church kind of deals with Islam and the, the holy wars they have against them. Because it's funny, because the Mechanicus is becoming Necrons. I mean, it might be because of the Void Dragon's influence, which would be really funny, because it's like... It's like Islam worships the same god as Catholicism worships, uh, just under really different understandings, sects, and practices, and with a different understanding of where important people factor into the history of the religion. Um, if the Void Dragon is quote-unquote God and is sitting in Mars and is causing the quote-unquote, you know, Mechanicus Catholic Church um, to be risen, but first made, <laughs> but first caused um, the, the Necrons to rise in the same exact way, it's almost like they're the same religion, like, rather, they're, they're two different religions worshipping the same God and coming out to heinously similar um, results while simultaneously hating the fucking shit out of each other and trying to destroy each other at all, at, at, at nearly every turn. Yeah, it kind of, you know, it kind of seems like the, the, the schisms of the two major religions of the world, Islam and, uh, you know, the Christian faith. How uh, the Christian faith has got the Protestant, the Orthodox, and then it has the uh, Catholic uh, denominations and then you know in Islam they have the Shia they have the Sunni I think they have another f uh, you know splinter I, I can't remember the name right now but yeah there's a lot of these major religions where you know people have diverted away simply because of interpretation of their religious texts and you know how they want to praise or uh, venerate their gods or you know what types of ceremonies or what type, what type of culture should be attributed to their religion. Um, yeah, you know, these things happen. And I guess it will also happen in the Mechanicus uh, uh, of Mars, you know, personnel in the Imperium of Man in the Star Wars galaxy. Mm. Um, and every time they don't, every time some Mechanicus guy is like, oh, maybe we use some Necron stuff for this. It's like a huge schism. And, and there you go. So my whole point is that um, my bad. I, I, I'm getting off my whole point. My whole point was that before we got the Necrons involved in that, and we can examine that later, that's a... I've only ever thought of it that way just now, so it's, it's interesting. Maybe I'm totally off base, but, but maybe I'm not. Um, but the whole thing about the Mechanicus has been internal schisms, has always been, the, like, how Protestantism is coming out of Catholicism, how Catholicism throughout most of its history has been based and founded around trying to unify uh, Christianity by... Um, preventing division and by keeping everything unified. In fact, a lot of people don't know this, but Catholic and Catholic, um, what that word means is universal. That's the original meaning of that word. The original meaning of the Catholic Church is the universal church. Um, it was an attempt by Constantine and the, and the men he had around him to create a unified new Roman religion uh, to center around. And basically... Um, that was all basically decided at the Council of Nikea. The, the real Council of Nikea, not the, the Warhammer 40k Council of Nikea, where very different things were decided, and they were all bad ideas. Um, so, in any case, my point to that is, yes, expect there to be schisms in the mechanics. Heck, there could be a, a universe in which um, C82 does not in any way like Ahsoka or care about Xenos or in any way even see that there could be anything that is holy or related about this universe and there is no Mechanicus person at all that is in any way happy with Star Wars technology and there would still be schisms that's that's the funny part about that like there's no way to get around it the Mechanicus is made out of this crap 
um, what is and isn't tech heresy isn't even really agreed upon between different Forge worlds that are all on the same side. Um, you know, it, it, it just is that case. I mean, you even have examples of, like, Belisarius Call getting apprehended during the Great Crusade, and his memcore is non-standard but legal, but non-standard, and that is immediately declared tech heresy by the dudes who find him, even though they're all on the same side. And, you know, there you go. Um, but, in any case, moving on from that. Um, before we move on, I would also like to say that, you know, I, I think I've said this before, that whatever C82 does now, you know, in terms of trying to convince others that we can take a different path, that we don't have to, you know, be in constant battle, in constant war. We don't have to always be doing this, you know, in order to protect humanity, that there is a different way of life in this galaxy and we can start afresh here. If he starts spewing any of that, you know, uh, in the faces of uh, other tech priests or, you know, other factions within the Imperium of Man, he will have a target on his back. You know, the powers that be, you know, those in the Skywatch, those in the Crimson Razors, uh, the admirals of the fleets, they will have a target on this man's uh, head for him to be executed or assassinated as soon as possible because he will destroy the cohesion and the unity of the Imperium of Man uh, forces in this galaxy. He will uh, divide the forces. He will make them weaker uh, as he takes a few people with him uh, on a journey that is different from you know the main body of the Imperium of Man, and that will be a schism. And you know, I'm I'm just you know assuming here. I'm just making my own opinions on this. That maybe uh, you know the powers that be are going to kill him before he's even able to launch his plans into fruition. They're going to try and kill him. Um, but I guess we'll see. We'll see in future episodes what a family too much time does, and whether. C82 is going to take the steam out of this train that is the Imperium of Man. Because right now they are plowing through the galaxy. They are pushing through the galaxy. Uh, and no one can seem to really stop them just yet. So maybe with C82's plans of his own version of how uh, people should lead their lives. Maybe that will take the steam out of this uh, bullet train. And it will come to a slow halt uh, over time. Yeah. With the Inquisitor clearly being more radical than Puritan, is it possible he will find his way to Korriban? <laughs> All things are possible. All things are possible. Is Korriban still existing? Or, yeah, I think it is, yeah. Hmm. Okay. Through chaos. In any case, um, let's see here. Will there be a scene of Tech Marine uh, Taslian informing his cha the chapter master of what he learned from Echo's mind? Potentially, but Taslian is separate right now from the rest of his fleet, largely because the, the, the Crimson Razors have split up to hit several tar targets simultaneously. Um, you better believe the Crimson Razors are jobbing. They are definitely all about work, 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 get that shit done, work that murder. So they're out there doing what they gotta do. Um, the Skywatch are holding back, they're watching, they're scouting, they're appraising, and they're setting up their structures and they're setting up their power base. Um, but the Crimson Razors are just one thing. They are space marines, and they don't, for even a second, think of themselves as actual leaders of a, of a faction in that way. They are warriors. They are weapons, and they know it, and they embrace it, as you can... But then what are they fighting for? I mean, yes, you know, fighting for human survival and all that stuff, but I don't know. It seems more as if they just want to fight for the sake of fighting. There's no duty, there's no honor behind any of this. It's just pure butchery. You know, at least with Skywatch, you can see, you know, they're trying to make a plan. They're trying to build a foundation that will last long before they are dead. But then with the Cr Crimson Razors, I'm not entirely sure what is their end goal. You know, do they want to have a secured future for uh, humanity? Or is this just a campaign of extermination? Yeah, I'm not sure on their side. You can probably tell from our librarian friend here. Um, so then, let's go ahead and move down. 
Q&A repost. Will you be posting all the commissioned art somewhere? Will you post the transcripts somewhere? Or will you make the, them available? Will you check uh, in again with the Skywatch and their colonization before season one? Okay, so these are... Oh, wow. Okay, these questions go on. Alrighty. Uh, yo, what is Vaughn.mo? Are you guys... What, what is this thing? I mean, it's like you guys just quote random pieces of my... Um, my thing. I'm gonna remove these. I don't know what these are. If someone wants to explain it to me, then I might let them stay up, but I have no idea. It looks like spam to me. Yeah, I, I think maybe it is a bit of spam. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Alright, back to the question of Men of a Thousand. Your question. So, let's begin with the first one. Will you be posting all the commissioned art somewhere? Yes. Check my Reddit. If you go to my Reddit and check my posts, um, you will find all of the commissioned art in there. And from there, you are free to download it and share it and keep it for yourself. That art is for the community. It's for everybody. Um, will you post the transcript somewhere? Yes, I will eventually. I plan to actually finish the series first, and then I'm gonna go through and edit it because um, all of this stuff is first draft, which is why it can be a little embarrassing for me to actually read it sometimes because I, I reuse words I shouldn't, and it's I, I end up being um, repetitive with certain phrases that I don't like to be repetitive. But but it's all first draft. I don't have enough time between releases to get a comprehensive second draft out. So, before I release it, what I want to do is finish all this. I mean, before I release just the transcript. I want to finish all this, then give myself maybe a few months or whatever to... Who knows how long it'll take, because this is getting so long at this point. Like, as long as a novel is, really. But, um... Uh, I will take a, a while to then go through it. And once I've gone through it, I'm going to edit it and pretty it up. And then I'll put it on the favorite fanfiction website. If you guys want to recommend to me a uh, website where I can post a, a fan fiction transcript, um, let me know. This is, <laughs> I'm so out of the standard community. I'm so I'm so out of the standard community that um, that this was the first place I really thought to, to, to put it um, was <laughs> was on YouTube. Hey, I, I also don't know. I also don't know why people, you know, post their liter literary work. Uh, you know, I was thinking maybe like Google Drive, make a Google Drive account and then put all your work there. Uh, you can just put the link, um, you know, under the videos that you uh, have already posted or wherever else. And then people can just go to that Google Drive link and they will have all of the, uh, you know, all the work that you've done. Yeah. I was thinking about that, but yeah. Um, in any case, let's go ahead. I mean, I also thought about putting on Reddit, but but Reddit is so hostile. My God, I feel so sorry for any creator who depends on Reddit for um for for any kind of recognition or good feeling or anything because Reddit is. I mean, I'll say this: it's not the most hostile place I've ever been online because I've been on 4chan and places like that, you know. But God, <laughs> I've I. I'll say this, if you're ever depressed or feeling even a little bit suicidal, do not go to Reddit. Do not talk to anybody on Reddit. You might be able to get away with that crap anywhere else, you know, and talk to a good person. But fuck, even good people treat you like shit on Reddit. <laughs> My bad. I'm, I'm ranting right now. Probably built up crap from other things, but... Yeah, uh, Reddit, I'm not really sure about. Um, I have a Reddit account, right? I, but it's just for show. I've tried to use it, but I, I can't have... I don't have that connection with it like I do with Twitter. Yeah, uh, to me, Twitter is just like flowing water. But when it comes to Reddit, I'm not entirely sure where to begin, how to begin. Um, I even checked up some YouTube channels and, you know, how they say we should use Reddit. But it's so complicated. Like, I, I'm not entirely sure about that. Um, but maybe I will try again and see what I can do with it. Um, yeah. Hmm. In any case, uh, let's move on from that. Will we check in again with the Skywatch and their colonization before the end of Season 1? Yes, we will. Will the Tempered Hands get their own history and episode like the Skywatch? Uh, they did get their own episode, I think. And it's even called um, The Crimson Razors, I think. Uh, as for will they get their own history? Um, maybe, maybe. You know, when I started writing out the history for the for the Skywatch and even the history for the Calambians, 
I did it on a burst of inspiration, but those things may never get completed. I mean, I know what they are, and I know what they are in my head, but they're not essential for the work, and they are a lot of work to, to make and post up. When the inspiration takes you and you can just do it effortlessly, then it's like, okay, that's a treat for all of us. But the only thing I'm going to dedicate to finishing right at this moment is season one. Um, and I will go ahead and take, man, my phone is just going on. I thought I'd silence it. Um, hold on. Okay. So, um, the only thing I'm going to dedicate to finishing is season one right now because it's the only thing I can really honestly promise because... I'll say this, I, I do feel very good that I'm getting this thing out of my system and that I'm finally completing this work that has been twirling around inside my head for oh so long. Um, but this can't be a job, um, not unless I'm able to get paid for it. And obviously nobody can be paid for fan fictions. I can open up a Patreon, but frankly, I'm kind of terrified that if I do open up a Patreon, it will cause this to cross some. It will cause this to cross some kind of line, and I don't want to cross that line because part of the reason I am willing to dedicate to finishing finishing at least season one is because going into this, I knew that I wouldn't be paid for it, and I knew that I wouldn't get anything for it, and that I would actually spend a lot, hundreds of my own dollars, to make this the way that I wanted it, um, and potentially get very little or nothing back. Now, a few of you guys actually have donated to me through PayPal, which I didn't even know. God, it's been years since I even touched my PayPal account, so I didn't even remember that I had one. Um, but that kind of stuff helped a lot. It did help me create more art, um, which I guess maybe I should... It's funny because I don't even feel, I don't even feel um, right taking profit from this. You see what I'm saying? Even donated profit. It's probably just a hang-up that I have that isn't based on anything super logical, but... Um, how do I say it? It's just... This is just supposed to be what it is. I don't want to jeopardize this being up. I would like this to just exist. Um, it deserves to exist, you know? Uh, I, I am a huge, huge fan of mythology, of human history told through stories. And what I find is that until the advent of capitalism, which I'm not an anti-capitalist, by the way. I'm going to say something critical about capitalism here. It doesn't mean that, that I don't think that it's definitely a more convenient, better, and efficient system than we've had in the past. But the way that we conduct it, especially with the idea of, of independent properties and protected things, it wouldn't be so bad if those things expired at some point. Um, and I understand why authors, I mean, trust me, I'm an author. I understand why you want to protect your independent property and not let other people profit off. But what it does do is stifle what we've been doing all of our human history, which is combining stories, making new stories, like not creating borders where they don't exist. Um, you know, one of my favorite things about the Greek pantheon is the raw amount of crossover that you see in the Greek pantheon. Um, heck, man, there was a time in, in there's a story in, about the Greek gods where they are attacked by this tremendous being. Uh, what was it? Um, it was Thanatos? No, no, Thanatos is like the Grim Reaper. It's it was um I forget what his name was. I think it's named after like a like a, a storm, like Cyclonus or Tempestus or something like that. He was a monster. He was like a, a a a titan that was just like the titan of monsters or something. He came after the 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 titan rebellion against the gods or the the, the fight against the gods. And my whole point about mentioning that is just this. So. This guy, this guy comes up to the Mount Olympus and is threatening everybody and all the Greek gods run away. So low-key, the story hardcore suggests, if not outright confirms, that the Greek gods ran away from Mount Olympus, turned into animals to escape, and then spent all their time in Egypt. And that's where all the Egyptian gods come from. Which, of course, is not canon to the Egyptian gods. But that's so cool. I like that somebody had the balls to say, well... There are gods over here and gods over there. They might all be different gods, but what if they were the same god and then made up a story about it? I, 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 I like that, you know, the way that human mythology does that. Like, Yeah, you know, the empires around the Mediterranean Sea, they were all connected for a very, very long time. Their people were connected for a very, very long time. The languages they spoke, uh, the amount of trade they had with one another, um, it has always been a very connected 
uh, part of the world, you know, throughout all the empires that have risen and fallen in that region of the world. And yeah, it, it's amazing that, you know, with them, they are so tolerant of each other's religions, if you, if you could say that, that they're able to bring in a religion from a different empire and bring it into their stories. And to say that, you know, their gods transformed into animals and thus became the gods of the Egyptians as they um, um, became refugees <laughs> from Greece heading over to Egypt and tried to become the gods of the Egyptians. Um, yeah, it's, that's interesting. It's really interesting. It's really funny um, that they would do something like that, that someone would write up something like that. Yeah, it's quite interesting. But like I said before, you know, the empires of those times were always interconnected. Uh, the Mediterranean Sea brought all of those empires together uh, through war, through trade, uh, through multicultural exchanges. It's always been like that with them. Um, and I'm not sure about right now in our modern era. I'm not entirely sure. Uh, but in the past, definitely. That's how those empires survived for so long, especially during, you know, ages of drought, uh, ages of, you know, a military conquest of one empire on the other. They all supported each other in one way or another, or they were all conquered under one umbrella. Um, for instance, the Roman Empire. And even when it divided into two empires, the Eastern Empire and the Western Empire, you know, they were still bound by the Mediterranean Sea and they were all still, you know, trying to eke out an existence from each other within the Mediterranean Sea. And yeah, it's interesting. If, another example, you know, we go to King Arthur. King Arthur um, is not one man. The moment you begin trying, I say trying because it's so hard, because it's so wacky, but when you begin trying to parse the history of Britain and the le legends of, of King Arthur, which are all heavily intermingled, you begin to realize that King Arthur is like eight or nine different heroes from different Welsh and Irish and, 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 and Saxon um, mythologies and stories that have all been renamed Arthur, and all of their stories and all their rep got given over to one guy, which is why King Arthur is like a Jesus figure and eventually became too big a deal to even take place in his own stories and started like appearing in other people's stories instead because he became the G from having had this accumulation. These things aren't possible with independent properties, um, at least not prof possible profitably. Now, I'm willing to accept that. I'm willing to accept that they're not possible profitably, but, but they should be possible. It is extremely even existentially depressing to me that this may not exist just because of this system. So for me, this has to come out. That's my whole rant about that. Um, let's see here. Do you play Warhammer 40k? Uh, I do, but if do you mean the tabletop? I don't play the tabletop. I don't have money for it. I actually, you know, the funniest thing is when I... If he doesn't have the money for it, I don't have the money for it. I had my money. Um, I had a sort of a Maybe I'll go into this at some point in my history, but I had a, a really harrowing experience prior to starting this series that sort of kicked my butt into gear to make things happen while I'm still here. Um, and and one of the things that had happened was that this money that I had saved up was like, okay, do I want to buy and per, you know buy a Warhammer army, maybe a painted Warhammer army, or maybe an unpainted Warhammer army and paint them all myself? That was part of what that money could have been for. And I decided, no, no, no. I'm not just going to play this game. Um, I, I don't want this to be just for me. This needs to be a bigger thing. And so I decided to go with what I went with. So no, I don't actually play the Warhammer 40k tabletop. I do love Dawn of War. And I do love reading Black Library. I've also played a lot of other Warhammer 40k games. Some of which I've liked, some of which I haven't liked. Um, you know, I, I have to say, I actually do like... Um, what do you call it? Space Hulk. A lot. The architecture, walking around those rooms and holding the weapons and stuff, just being in that environment is super badass. Um, but yeah, there you go with that. Let me... Um, well, with me, I've only played one uh, Warhammer game. It was called Mechanicus. And yeah, it was fun. It was a fun game. Uh, the other games I have reacted to 
uh, gaming reviews uh, on them and yeah some of them looked very interesting others were a bit uh you know a bit old ish but you know they were good they were still good still very good action action uh sci-fi fantasy type of games and yeah they look good um the tabletop i have not seen uh anyone play it well i haven't seen anything about it on youtube i've only heard of it you know here and there and maybe there'll be some youtubers would reference the tabletop game but I haven't actually seen someone actually play it. Um, I think that is something that I might have to look up on uh, for, a, for a reaction, maybe, uh, later in the future. And yeah, the franchise has got a lot of content on it. Uh, and right now there's a new game out currently. What is it called again? Dark Tide. I've seen some gameplay from that. That looked amazing <laughs> kind of scary and gory and you know with all those abominations and then you know you're a ragtag team of i think five or six members having to fight through this entire hive city trying to uh you know solve the case uh and yeah fighting against these abominations and all these other nasty things in the underhive um so yeah it looked like a very nice game and there's also another one on PlayStation 5 that's coming out. I'm not entirely sure when. I've seen one trailer for it. Uh, and yeah, that game also kind of looks like it's going to be amazing. So yeah, the time for Warhammer 40K is nigh. <laughs> you know, they have been rising slowly, higher and higher. And now they're reaching that pinnacle, I think. Uh, and once they reach that pinnacle, they will have everyone on a chokehold. I assure you, uh, they're going to have everyone on a chokehold. Mm, okay, let's continue. You go ahead and see what genre will your universe be in and what type of story. This is for your custom writing. Ah, oh, you'll see. I plan to tell more than one story. Though, uh, a quick spoiler, I'll say this. I do plan to start somewhere in fantasy. Fantasy is my root. I grew up raised on the milk of Tolkien, and therefore, that is where I intend to go um, to begin with. So let's see here. Are the Skywatch and the Crimson Razors in contact with each other? Uh, yes, they are in contact with each other. Uh, indeed. When, why is Padme going to ax him? Uh, you'll have to see. Uh, what is what is going to do there, especially if the Jedi lose? You'll have to see this lady I, she's always been that person <laughs> who would jump into trouble you know to try and resolve the situation so yeah i'm not really surprised i was surprised actually when that episode came out when uh i think it was palpatine who suggested that padme was going to head over to where anakin skywalker is or something like that um and yeah definitely she's going to be going there soon um but i think she's going to die there's something in me that just tells me that she's going to die when she gets there. Uh, whether the Star Wars Galaxy wins or not on Axiom, somehow, some way, she's going to die. But hopefully, I'm wrong about that. Yeah. Is the burning skull in the tempered hands heraldry a reference to Ma to Manus, the Legion of the Damned? <laughs> you guys are fucking sharp. <laughs> you guys are fucking sharp. Uh, you know what? It's probably me being lame and not realizing that you guys are a bit sharper than I give you credit for. But yeah, maybe, maybe, maybe it is. So let's see here. So, magnetically interlocking blades and gears, huh? Will Kali give a Oh my bad, I'm just reading the next <laughs> I'm just giving gi I'm just reading the next uh <laughs> just reading the next comment. Uh, let's see here. Actually, how many have I read already? Because I think I've been on here for a good minute. I'll go ahead and read one more. So let's go to Crypto Penguin. Crypto Penguin. Will the Yuuzhan Vong come into this story later? Maybe. If the Jedi and Sith were given a full explanation specifically about who and what the God Emperor is, uh, these beings who have the ability to directly control the Force can actually be coming. It's faster. Wait, wait. About who and what the God Emperor is? And if the Jedi and the Sith were ever given a full explanation specifically about how, what the God Emperor and the God Chaos 
are, how would they react to these entities? Okay. Wow, this is probably going to be the last question. I'm sorry, guys, that we're in the last in, in the other videos. I'm probably not going to be able to get to them because this is just this one is going to probably eat time. All right, so if they were given a full explanation, um, well, the, the problem here is this: they don't have to believe anything that they're told, and the Jedi, especially, and even the Sith, honestly, because they're not better; they're just honest um the jedi delude themselves a lot like all the time and this is canonical in fact if you want to look at the top 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 best example of this when yoda is called to the force priestesses by the spirit of qui-gon jinn he he confides this in the jedi and while they do not immediately denounce deny or reject what he has said they come at it with an enormous amount of skepticism, and once they begin their meditation, though they do sit there and meditate dead ass for like a whole day or more, um, they sitting there and examining Yoda's memories and everything, or doing whatever it was they were doing for that long, they still came to the conclusion that it was more likely that Master Yoda was deluded than that somebody had existed in the Force as a ghost. And that was almost unanimous in the council, to the point that Yoda needed to have Anakin's help to get away from them and go to the Force Priestess, and to the point that I believe Yoda did not feel confident enough revealing to the rest of the Jedi Council what he had learned from the Force Priestesses, because Yoda, in the course of his training to become a Force Ghost um, and to learn the technique, essentially learns everything. He learns what the Sith are going to do. He, I mean, he doesn't know that Order 66 is how it's going to happen, but he really should. He knew that the Sith had created an army for them, that their enemies had made an army for them. He knew from those visions that the Jedi were going to be destroyed by it. Um, he knew that it was going to be a betrayal that comes from within, that comes from the Republic. He understood all these things, and he didn't act to prevent them. Now, I think there's a lot of bullshit on Yoda's part for that, but even if we, but if we give him the benefit of the doubt, which we should because he's like a wise 800-year-old master Jedi, the reason he wouldn't is because he would have foreseen that going to the Jedi Council and trying to tell them this would have only made them doubt him, not the other things. And that he may have only exacerbated the problem, if that was even possible, than actually helped to alleviate it. I disagree with him, um, but this is the probably the reason he came to these conclusions. Otherwise, he would have just responsibly gone to the rest of the Jedi Council and been like, Hey guys, we need to start pulling the Jedi, like... Into like now that the war is coming to a close, we need to start hiding everybody, like pulling back and preparing for a cataclysmic event that I have foreseen. And you know, if they were mature and shit, they would have been like, "Well, Yoda has not really been wrong in 800 years, and he's the Grand Master for a good goddamn reason. So we should probably take him seriously and and deal with him being wrong if he is wrong after the fact. But like, take him seriously for now. Yoda didn't have confidence that shit would happen. Yoda had confidence that Mace Windu would be like, no, we need to take over the courts, and I'm a politician, basically, and blah, 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 and yeah, there you go. So, you know, I also think that maybe, you know, with the dark side, it shrouded uh, the Jedi. It shrouded them of their confidence, uh, their uh, foresight abilities, if, they, if any of them actually had that. You know, it... It, sh it shrouded them, it uh, made them feel a bit apprehensive when it came to anything that was beyond their understanding, if I can say that. You know, if it was beyond their understanding, they would push it aside and say, no, this is not true. This is, maybe this is just the delusions of an old man or, you know, they, they'll always try and make up that kind of excuse. Uh, at just like a finish much time to say that they were deluded. Um, but yeah, I would say that, you know, the, the dark side of the force and even fear, it shrouded them. It uh, kept them a bit paranoid, I would say. Um, and they had every right to be because this was something that was beyond them. And they couldn't really sense the fact that the one that they've been looking for, the Sith Lord, has been right under their nose this entire time. That's just how powerful uh, the dark side of the force was on them. And it was too late for them. They couldn't really uh, discern or detect anything 
uh, even at that last second. Yeah. Hmm. They don't have to agree with anything that they hear or are told. But if we had an example where, like, and the same thing goes with the Sith, by the way, same damn thing. So if we had an example where we have Palpatine sitting in a room, and by the way, and this is also going to be an explanation, I'll try to sum this up, the rule of two never made any sense. The idea of the Sith getting stronger by it instead of weaker when they're, when they're assassinating each other before they can ever learn all of their secrets, um, it never made any sense. The idea that the Sith um, would, would willingly pass on all their knowledge to an apprentice at no benefit to themselves makes no sense. None of that ever made sense. Apprentices to, to Sith Masters, for the most part, have been looked at as assassins and tools, and never as actual successors if they're doing it right, like if the Sith Lord is doing it right. So, And, and how is it possible that the dark side of the Force, you know, the Sith Lords, how, is it ab how are they able to maintain their population if they're always killing each other like that? How are they able to maintain their population uh, you know, with the master and the apprentice, a master and apprentice, if the apprentices are going to be killing their masters and the masters are going to also be killing their apprentices, you know, how were they able to maintain a population uh, that could rule over the galaxy and also fight against the Jedi? You know, I, that's something that also comes to question, comes to mind, you know, uh, with me. I don't know about you guys, but with me. It does come to mind, like, you know, how were they able to maintain themselves as a civilization or as an empire if they continue to kill one another like that? I mean, this notion of passing down institutional knowledge or should I say force knowledge and power over to the next person like that? I don't know. It just doesn't seem enough, you know. When you have those who are wise and who have deep knowledge with the force you know you have that stable foundation for the young ones to grow on and you make more young ones and more young ones make more uh, make themselves more into masters and those masters make more young ones and it just continues to grow like some sort of uh you know building but then with the sith lords i'm not sure if they did anything like that you know, it just seems like it was the master, the apprentice, and that's where it cuts off right there. Either the master is dying or the apprentice is dying, and then <clears throat> nothing really is built up. It's just at that same level. Uh, maybe they do get more powerful, but other than that, like, I just don't see how were they able to maintain themselves as a population. The retcon, or rather the clarification that we got in... Um, what was it? It was The Rise of Skywalker. The, in my opinion, the only good thing that came out of that movie, the only good thing that came out of The Rise of Skywalker, is the revelation that the way the Rule of Two works is all that the Sith possess each other. That no knowledge is lost, really, because when one Sith assassinates the other, the older Sith possesses the body of the younger, and takes on their personality, but effectively, when Palpatine is like, I am all the Sith, he is all the Sith, and that's great. That's good. So he has split personalities. All those, I don't know how many <laughs> Sith Lords have died at the hands of their own apprentices, you know, but it must be like hundreds of thousands of them. You know, all of them are crammed up into one person's mind. Yikes. I thought the God Emperor was, you know, having it tough with multiple personalities all in one body or all in one spirit but this guy is even worse it seems yikes good i like that i don't like anything else about the movie but this rhymes very well with what we've seen in, in legends it even makes sense as to why darth bane was desperate to have darth xana kill him and not just see him die of old age um darth bane loved darth xana Perhaps like a daughter, or perhaps like something more. But they had a very intimate relationship with each other, despite the fact that they were Sith. And Darth Bane desperately wanted Darth Xana to not just let him pass and die peacefully. And it wasn't just about dying violently either. He could go and kill himself against Jedi if that was what he was really after. No. Darth Bane wanted, needed, 
Darth Xana to kill him personally in single combat. And now we know why. We know why he was desperate for it. We knew why he was unwilling to compromise. We even know why he was unwilling to grow weaker. Like why he was like, you have to do it now because now I'm aging and I'm only getting weaker. And so it has to be done now. We know why. He's trying to save himself. He's a Sith. He's fallen to the dark side. He's selfish. Even when he's in love, he's ultimately selfish. So, my point is just this. So Sidious sitting in this room, the Sidious that we're talking about, the canonical Sidious, he isn't just Sheev Palpatine. He is Sheev Palpatine, and he acts in that persona in, in most ways, but he is also every Sith that has come before, which is why he is so powerful in, in regards to Star Wars. So... So he's sitting in this room, Sheev and all the Sith inside of one body, more or less a single personality, and the Emperor walks in. So what Sheev would see immediately is the next apprentice. He would try desperately after confirming how powerful the Emperor is, which probably wouldn't actually take a physical demonstration of any kind. Um, he would try to convince the Emperor that he is very powerful, maybe even more powerful than he himself is, but that he could be more powerful if he embraced the way of the Sith, that he could gain power never before seen if he did this. Um, he, would des he would be desperate to teach uh, the Emperor the ways of the Sith, to make the Emperor his apprentice, even if he is technically more powerful, and then to be killed by him so that he can then flow into the Emperor and, in theory, become like that become the next one true Sith, the Emperor. You, you know, if that were a scenario, right, where the where Palpatine would meet up with the Emperor and he would try to convince the Emperor to be, become his apprentice, the Emperor would flatly disagree. He would flatly say no to that kind of suggestion. The Emperor himself is a very proud man. He is a very proud man. Uh, he is so confident in himself that... He sees no other one, no person as his equal. He sees no one as his, uh, you know, potential rival or anything like that. He sees no one who could be, come his master. He is his own master. He controls his own destiny, multiple versions of his destiny, you know. So there's just no way. Uh, Palpatine will try, <laughs> but the emperor will be like, no, no, thank you. I know what's going to happen. I know all possible futures of what's going to happen. And, you know, your, 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 your uh, request uh, or your demand or whatever it may be for me to become your apprentice is pointless. It is useless. Uh, and you'll probably say, I've seen a possible future where you might try to attack me. I know what I'm going to do next. <laughs> so try it, try it, and you'll see what happens. So yeah, he can try, but Palpatine will ultimately fail. The Emperor is all too aware of what possession is. He is all too aware of what the dark side really is. It's just nascent demons making you do shit that feeds them, which is why you, know, you have actions that are fueled by the dark side and actions that are just fueled by natural passion. Um, He's aware of these things. The Emperor wouldn't for even a second concede or want to be an apprentice to Sidious. Not only that, but he probably wouldn't have very much to gain. Um, the, the, the techniques used by the Dark Side and by the Sith are eminently self-destructive. And that's literally how they all die. They destroy themselves because they can't turn Force Lightning off once they turn it on. So, um, so he would turn that down. This would probably cause Palpatine to go into powerful self-denial or delusion or rage. And he'd go one of three ways. The things that I just mentioned, or he decided to go for the long game and think something up. And I don't really know where he would go at this point because we don't have a lot of examples of Palpatine encountering people that he has to appease or who are more powerful than him. He may very well go straight into toady mode where he's like, okay, I'm gonna serve you. I don't care what it is. You know, all right, you don't gotta be Sith, man. All right, put the sword down. I'm going to be your servant from now on, because you're clearly more powerful, and my Sith religion tells me that, that that might makes right. And then secretly, while he's serving the Emperor and doing whatever it is, task he's going about doing, he'd be trying to leverage himself into getting whatever power the Emperor has and learning all that strength for himself, and potentially still subverting the Emperor into the way of the Sith. Yeah, I see that happening. I do see that happening. Where Palpatine, you know, bends the knee to the Emperor and pledges allegiance and loyalty to him. 
well in the mean uh, in the meantime or in the background you know he is plotting and scheming and gathering information on the emperor whatever it may be and you know one day he will strike and will it be successful we don't know so those are that reaction for for palpatine if you had the Jedi Council, the Jedi High Council, because the thing is that when you ask me how the Jedi would react, it's hard to tell you that because the Jedi are all individual people and the Sith are all one guy. Um, if you had the Jedi High Council in a room and they were told like they were in a council and then the guy comes All for one and one for all. <laughs> and he's like, hey, there's a guy that's an emperor from a different galaxy and he's about to make diplomatic contact with the Republic. But before he makes diplomatic contact with the Republic, he wants to meet with you guys because he's a force user and you guys are force users and he wants to take your measure and stuff. So he's going to be in here in a minute or two. So we're just letting you guys know that he's going to come meet you. And they're like, okay, we're going to meet this guy, Emperor, whatever. And he walks in on them, which of course the Emperor is like this, he's like a literal giant, you know, so he probably wouldn't even fit without fucking man seeing himself into a smaller, a smaller form. But he walks into the room and provided he isn't trying to hide what he is, he's like a a walking astronomicon. Obviously, he isn't that powerful without the chair, um, as in, like, the beacon isn't isn't viewable from nearly every place in the galaxy if he's not sitting on the Golden Throne. But if you are in the same room as him, hell, if you're on the same planet as him, there is a miniature astronomicon walking around unless he's trying to hide it. Um, so they'd, he'd walk in and that would just be on display. Hell, they would know that he's there well beforehand if he's not hiding it, but there you go. The Jedi would immediately want to test him. Not to become a Jedi or anything. Obviously, the Emperor is far, far... Are they going to test him like how they tested Anakin Skywalker? You know, uh, during Phantom Menace, Mace Windu was holding, um, like, an iPad. <laughs> and then they asked Anakin Skywalker to, you know, use the Force to uh, figure out what's on the iPad. Yeah, probably they're going to give him a, a test like that too old and too practiced and too into himself and into what he's doing to be a Jedi or to be inducted into the Jedi Order as they are right now. Uh, former Je previous Jedi Orders were much more willing to accept anybody into the Order as long as they were willing to learn the ways of the Jedi. Not so with, with the modern Order. So what they, what they would want to test him for is to see if he's a Darksider. It's like, okay, this guy's got this incredible powerful force essence. He's probably the chosen one or something similar because he's definitely extremely powerful. Um... We have to make sure he's not a dark sider. And what they would discover is kind of an odd thing. So the dark side is called to you by actions of passion and typically actions of evil and stuff like that, right? So we have things that are like that. Um, a good example of that is like Anakin killing the sand people. Yes, okay, here's a great example. So we have Anakin killing the sand people and Anakin choking Padme. Two different actions that both feed upon and fuel the dark side. Um, however, let's, let's imagine a universe now in which the dark side doesn't exist and that influence is entirely negated, okay? Anakin might still have killed all the sand people. That was not necessarily an action that was, that was the dark side enforcing or influencing him at that point. Like, it is possible for a man to see his dying, tortured mother and then to feel so much rage and indignation and and desire for vengeance that he goes out and has his vengeance and the dark agreed agreed dark side doesn't need to factor into that that could just be something that happens but then we have him on mustafar where padme comes out and he begins to force choke her and accuse her of having of having brought obi-wan here to kill him obviously anakin is under the sway of the dark side at this point um not only are his eyes blazing sith but aside from that um, what he's doing is totally illogical. It is obviously much more likely that Padme either brought Obi-Wan expecting him to help mitigate you down because your best fucking friends and literally like the only other person close like close to him aside from herself or that Obi-Wan snuck aboard the ship, didn't reveal to her that he was there and followed her knowing that she would lead him straight to Anakin. There are many other explanations as to Obi-Wan being there that don't involve him believing that Padme has betrayed him. This is pure dark side influence. This is the dark side grabbing Anakin and pulling him down to where he wouldn't otherwise be. So back to the Emperor. What they would find with the Emperor <coughs> is that the Emperor is all too capable and, and, and willing even 
to commit atrocities, genocides, things that are definitely not light side, not compassionate, not like that. However, they would not be able to find even the remotest amount of evidence that the emperor himself is influenced by the dark side. In fact, the emperor takes great pains to immunize himself and other psychers that he comes in contact with from the malign entities of the warp and from the darker influences of the warp. Whenever a person in 40k who has been soul bound to the emperor or anything like that does something evil, it is not implied that this is because they're being influenced by chaos or by the warp. It's implied that this is because they are humans of a flaw and this is what is carrying it out. And this is true. The, in the Imperium, the dark side, although it is used a lot, is not mastered to almost anyone because the dark side is hated and feared and frankly almost abused, which I guess it really likes. The dark side is kind of a kinky bitch that way, but the idea is just that that while the Emperor and Space Marine Librarians and Primaris Psychers may use the dark side constantly, they actively fight against its influence. They know that it's there, they don't even know that it's possible to use the warp at all and not have that influence there. So for them it's not even parsing away the dark side from the light side, it's just the warp is evil. When you use it you have to make sure it doesn't make you evil. Um, so they would find this guy with this, with this weird set and the problem is that the Jedi have not really parsed out themselves that there is necessarily a difference. When you see the Jedi talk, when you see the way they act, when you see the way they philosophize, you come to the understanding that they almost don't think that people exist. Like, people are just vessels for the Force. And there's different amounts of Force in each vessel, which determines how well you are, how good you are at using the Force. And then there's also how much of a particular element of the Force is within you, which is, which is the result of actions that you've taken or that have been taken around you. You know, how much of the dark side is in you, how much of the light side is in you. And, and your actions are both the triggers for these things and results of these things in a very cyclical pattern, you know. Seeing this cyclical pattern being broken and outright defied is not something the Jedi believe can be done. Um, that's why they're categorically against things like marriage and against things like um like a, a, a killing uh though they're less against this than marriage apparently but against killing uh helpless prisoners no matter what their disposition or circumstance if they are helpless you are not supposed to kill them because they don't believe that you can take these actions independent of the dark side doing one means the other and here in the emperor they would have a super empirical example of not only that happening, where one is doing both, like, you know, he is doing an action that would normally prompt the dark side and also shrugging the dark side off, and is showing that there's, there's only correlation, not causality between them, um, but is also so much more powerful than they themselves are, to a degree that is outright staggering. Like, the Emperor is nearly... If the Emperor were walking around on a planet with you, it would be difficult to tell the difference between the Emperor and one of the Ones. I mean, there may be a difference. The Ones and their upper limits of their powers are hard to quantify and understand, and they can only be killed via very specific weapons that they themselves have made. But at the same time, the Emperor could very well be, on a personal level, even more powerful than the Ones. If, if, if the Emperor came before the Father and decided to battle him, I believe that there would be a battle. Whereas when Anakin tried the same thing, the father just took the Anakin's lightsaber in his hand and sheathed it for him, which is not even something that you knew could happen with lightsabers. Um, so it would cause a pretty crazy uh, philosophical schism within the Order. And I want to say that it wouldn't be a schism. I want to say it would only be a debate. But with people like Mace Windu on board, and with people like Yoda on board, and with people like Anakin on board, and with people like Obi-Wan on board, there is just too much... That's the biggest problem with the Jedi Order at the time of the Clone Wars, is that they've made all these rules and sacrifices, and they don't get to benefit from any of them, because they still defy them too much, but not just that, because they just don't, they have missed, like, they, they, they miss the forest for the trees, they just don't, they don't get that it's not just about these rules, and so... They've become invested, they've become attached, they've become everything they weren't supposed to be, and worst, worst of all, 
they don't even realize it. And this is why it's such a poignant moment for Anakin when Mace Windu tells him he's too dangerous to be kept alive. And then he turns to the dark side and cuts off Mace Windu's hand. Why? Because Palpatine had told him the same thing in regards to Dooku. And that just revealed to him that the Jedi weren't so different from the Sith at all. That they were just playing their own game. And frankly, though Sidious is evil, he is right in this case. He's made right by the folly of Mace Windu and powerful Jedi like him, who have conflated their influence in the Republic with what it means to be a Jedi. But uh, uh, there you go with, with that. So that was a long one, wasn't it? Let's see where we're at here. All right, let's finish up your last question. Just how shocked and pissed will the Jedi slash Sith be when they find out that the Imperial FTL travel is traveling through the Force Warp? It would be funny to see them so pissed when they realize that while they spent all their lives trying to be one with the Force, while the Imperium already had have a scientific way to directly enter the Force Warp, but instead use it for more mundane means. Yeah, so yeah, this is going to be pretty funny because the Imperium has effectively created a technological means by which to open warp gates. And we see that this is possible in Star Wars. Darth Momin creates one of these, and it's fantastic. Look up Darth Momin. He's nothing but fun if you're a fan of the Sith. But, um... Uh, yeah, the Jedi and the Sith both work really hard to make portals into the Force. Now, I'll say this. The Jedi have literally made, like, a webway. And if you don't know what I'm talking about, go ahead and look up the, um... The... The Jedi Temple on Lothal that is effectively a webway. It might even be better than a webway because it has the capacity to traverse and pierce time as well as space. Though, in theory, the webway should do that too. The warp is never really friendly with chronology or time. Um, and the webway is built into it. But there you go. So, we do have examples of those things, but the modern Jedi have lost all of that. The modern Sith have, well... They haven't lost it, but they're not interested in it. Sid Sidious is the modern Sith, and he's not trying to make portals into the Force. He doesn't really stand to gain much from that. So, um, it would be very interesting for them when they find that out. However, there is one parallel. They would actually know already of one species. Not species. One order. Well, actually, I guess they kind of are a species. The ang are a specific species as well, an order of monks. The ang monks use this form of travel as well. But they don't use it with technology. The ang monks have realized the method of using the Force that allows them to use warp travel. And it's actually even better than what you see the Imperium using. The ang monks have the most perfect form of warp travel imaginable. The ang monks. Okay. I'll, I'll search them out on Google. And the only thing that could fuck it up is needing to have Geller fields, which they don't currently need to have in the Star Wars universe. Uh, the ang monks can basically just fold space their entire ships and travel through the Force and instantaneously appear wherever they want to go. And they have a lot of control over that. They don't appear before they left and they don't appear a thousand years after. Um, so they may go to the ang monks for more knowledge on how this, this works. Or they may not. Stan like Honestly, the only people who would really even know about the Angti monks are the Jedi who have been in the library like Jocasta knew for most of their lives. Because while well, the Jedi maintain peaceful relations with the Angti monks, the Jedi are so far up their own asses that they typically don't... They don't keep up to date with a lot of the other Force traditions in the galaxy. They just see them as inferior. Like, you guys are all just proto-Jedi, and eventually, one day, if you're not Darksiders, you'll come around to our way of thinking. It's a really, really elitist way of thinking, and it may result in them not even thinking to look this way, as they didn't during the Clone Wars. I mean, my god, you look at how much of a conflict the Clone Wars got into, and they didn't, the Jedi didn't even think to go looking for any of the other Force traditions. They just ended up fighting the ones that joined the Separatists. So there you go. Um, let me see here. Okay, I think that was the last question. Woo! Okay, I think this is also one of the longest Q and A's, which is fitting, right? Yeah, for one of the longest, uh, for the longest uh, video to date. All right, guys. So I'm gonna go ahead, take a break, uh, start getting ready to write the next piece. Next time, we will see more and more of the battle folding into one location. And for those of you that have been waiting for the arrival of the Tempest, know that your scions are on the horizon. So, until then, I'll see you next time.
Okay, guys, that's it uh, with episode 21 after talk made by a fan with too much time. This is uh, in relation to Star Wars versus Warhammer 40k episode 21 struggle. Um, yeah, we've had an update from Advantage Too Much Time, you know, discussing about how difficult it was to do episode 21, all the missing files, the missing information, the missing audio files, you know, all of this hard work, having to repeat it over and over again. Um, and But he still says he still has the passion in him, he still has the determination in him to continue uh, doing uh, this job and you know he's not being paid he's not being remunerated in any type of way this is just his passion and he's showing it to us and yeah I can't thank him enough for doing something like this because it's really been entertaining uh, so far from episode 1 all the way to episode 21 really entertaining and hopefully I can see more later on next week because it's still Sunday right now, yeah. So next week, next week Thursday, hopefully. <sighs> why, why do I, why do I put myself in that position? I know, I know. Next week, there's still going to be power outages. But yes, I am going to be reacting to episode twenty-two next week. <laughs> um, but yeah, it's good to also hear that you know he has his issues, he has his problems, but he deals with them and he continues on. And we also got, you know, various questions from uh, multiple people uh, asking about, you know, whether possible factions are going to be entering in. Again, you know, like the Orcs uh, talking about the Crimson Razors, whether we're going to have a deep, uh, you know, law into them and, and, and into their background, uh, per se. Um, and also, you know, how the Star Wars Galaxies factions are going to react to the uh, to the existence of the Chaos Demons and, and, and the Chaos Gods and you know how would they perceive the Emperor and how would they want to either use the Emperor or have the Emperor join the Jedi or you know just just a what-if scenario what if the Emperor uh, you know stood before the Jedi Council what if the Emperor stood before Palpatine or Palpatine stood before the Emperor I should say you know all of these uh, what if scenarios also being discussed and also about C82 and what kind of potential uh, future is laid out for him in you know his epiphany his realization that there could be a better way for his people to live in this galaxy instead of always committing themselves to war um, and you know how how difficult it can be to merge these two franchises together and make a brand new content you know a, a collaboration a joining of forces uh, to bring something like this into fruition uh, like a financial much time said that you know economically it's not viable for companies to do something like this but you know as fans you have that kind of leeway to do it. You have that space within uh, social media, within YouTube to do something like this. Of course, yes, you still be copyright striked by whichever company, but you know, you still have that kind of, uh, uh, you know, space to do something like this. And, you know, we can hope that one day uh, the companies would allow the fans to further express themselves with uh, the content that's available. Um, but yeah, maybe that's just wishful thinking, you know, a wishful hope. But yeah, hopefully one day. <laughs> um, but yeah, guys, I guess that's it. That's it for today with A Fan Too Much Time. Remember, if you want to check out the original video as well as A Fan Too Much Time's YouTube channel, the links are in the description below. If you like my reaction, please give me a like, comment, and subscribe to my channel. Click on the notification bell if you want to be updated with my latest videos. And I will see you guys next week. Okay? Bye-bye.